Good afternoon, everybody. So I have like 90 minutes, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to present this topic. Uh, the this topic is about a um, cache coherence uh, protocol standardization, including logical and physical interconnects. It's been my passion for seven years, and. Uh, so the agenda is, uh, I'll briefly show you the, the, the charts on the data center CPU vision. I've showed them last year at the OrConf when um, they started sort of baking some of these things. Not that we are, have them fully baked, but uh, I'll just briefly remind on that. And then I jumped on the kind of new stuff that, I, that I'm happy to talk about today. It's an OmniExtend backplane reference design. It's a hardware that we've been building for um, about a year now that we think we'll have back in mid-November. And, uh, and you should assume everything here is open source or there is some sort of a plan how to uh, uh, open source so all the bits and pieces off of it. Then I'll compare OmniExtend to other memory-centric concepts just to kind of explain how you can access memory in a large-scale system. I'll give some details on the OmniExtend system design up to my technical ability to understand them. I know you know, uh, sort of two layer of people in my department, the, the, uh, obviously, who worked on it, so I can help, help uh, you know, if I don't answer stuff today, I'll kind of connect you to engineers all the way down to answer every last uh, question. But the details are programmable Ethernet switches, um, how you do cache coherence, and uh, our data plane implementation, which is you, how you pack tiling on top of Ethernet L1. And then I'll show some results uh, that make me really happy and, you know, I can sleep when I think about it, uh, which is uh, two sockets and a switch and stuff is working. And performance measurements, which is uh, uh, cycles and microseconds on the actual latencies. And then conclusions and what are the next step, what you can expect, uh, you know, on the next year's ORCONF. Um, all right, so data center CPU vision is, um, is really... Um, uh, about connectivity. Uh, um, the, the CPU technologies have matured pretty nicely. Uh, CPU cores in uh, modern day commercial CPUs can do amazing things. But there is a lot of uh, emphasis on, on uh, CPU vendors controlling interfaces. So it's actually very difficult to, to produce a memory device or a smart uh, accelerator for machine learning workloads and then get enough attention or have enough funding to be connected to the CPU. So a lot of CPU interfaces are really proprietary, controlled, and in some cases, even if you have unlimited amount of money, you can get a license. So the, the key focus of that vision is um, using open source technologies to get enough performance, which really in the next century will be having enough uh, um, uh, out of order core performance to have a decent I.O. performance so that Linux um, I.O. and TCP IP stack can operate at the full bandwidth. And then having a CPU socket actually support a low latency uh, memory and accelerator interfaces with smart features as needed. For example, uh, if somebody really doesn't want to do DMAing all the time, to have an access to the same memory. So those are things that are important. So developing those standards, enabling those standards, Enabling those standards with, with open source RTL for the IPs, I think those are the key, key critical things. Um, so part of this same thing is, uh, so what, what do I really mean by all of this? You, uh, you want to have a multiplicity of uh, sockets, at least two. <laughs> and on each one, you are going to have a bunch of RISC V cores. And it doesn't have to be RISC V. It could be any other open source uh, ISA-based architecture. Uh, RISC-5 is kind of nice because there's a lot of reference designs from Berkeley that use tiling, cache coherence protocol, so you can kind of get both. If you, if you go with something else, like, like uh, MIPS or OpenPower, there's yet to be work yet to be done on a cache coherence protocol actually being open. And then you want to put these uh, nodes together, uh, and the requirements are preferably that you can use some sort of cabling that's not terribly expensive that maybe uh, FI is already standardized for. And then you want to get, you know, and th this is a great thing that I kind of didn't know a couple of years ago that, that it was possible, but became possible. You know, can you make the switch for this uh, SMP system, can you make it 
reasonably, you know, reasonably cost effective. By reasonably, I mean can you avoid uh, having a $100 million ASIC project and buy something commercial off the shelf. So this is what we've done here. Our system uses Barefoot Network's commercial switch, which I believe is sub $10,000. So with a reasonable budget, any academic institution, any research group should be able to actually acquire it. It's not, it's not prohibitively expensive like a ultra super proprietary QPI switch that may come from some major OEMs that could easily go into millions of dollars. And on top of it, it's actually open source, meaning runs the microcode that you have access to and that you can change and modify, etc. Um, so we've been working on it for last 18 months. And uh, we expect uh, to tape out OmniExtend backplane reference uh, design in, um, well, actually we taped it out, the vendor is working on the PCB. PCB itself is, is, has a lot of layers, it's quite expensive. So we are taping out about uh, two dozen units, I think. Uh, we'll, we'll make all uh, the Allegro files are available to Chips Alliance members. And, uh, and we'll try to, you know, de depending on how much money Western Digital has, we'll try to give some freebie boards as well and figure out how can other people kind of get, get, access, get access to the actual boards. What the system does, it's, um, it, uh, the centerpiece is a Barefoot Network's uh, programmable switch and has a uh, bunch of uh, standardized connectors. It has a bunch of QSFP connectors and then it has a bunch of um, uh, small form factor EDSFF connectors show, shown here on the left, left and the right that uh, enable, uh, enable uh, building a compute, memory, accelerator and other devices that you can actually plug into this uh, backplane. Um, and the vision is uh, literally what's kind of shown here, enable heterogeneous compute, enable an architecture when uh, one company can, can make a compute card, another company that maybe has a memory technology can make memory cards, people who specialize in accelerators can make accelerator cards and they can all kind of plug in into a common backplane. That, 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 is, that is the part of, part of that, uh, that vision. Um, uh, some of the some of the uh, uh, highlights for the for the um, backplane reference design, and this is probably the best referring literally through to the PDF or PowerPoint of this presentation, is what we really have there for connectivity. Um, based on the Barefoot Network's uh, Tofino programmable switch, it has an amazing bandwidth. It has 64 times 100 gigabit uh, ports, and more importantly, it supports a P4 programmable pipeline. So, so I have a question for the audience, just out of my curiosity, since this is like a FPGA heavy group. How many people is familiar or at least heard of P4? All right, so it's still, it's still kind of, you know, maybe on like 15% kind of rise. P4 is a hardware definition language um, that uh, allows you defining the functionality of the programmable pipeline for the programmable switch. And... Uh, it's nicest to use the barefoot Tofino part, but it can also work with a bunch of Xilinx parts that have a very high I.O., which is how we started doing things in this project and then we transitioned to barefoot, barefoot networks. All right, so in terms of onboard interfaces, I'm not going to read all of those. We obviously support QSAP connectors and we support a variety of small four-factor uh, connectors that allow people building these compact, you know, computer memory cards that could plug into this. Uh, and then um, it's interesting thing just to kind of uh, provide um, provide a reminder: how is OmniExtend different from some of the other standards or some of the other uh, other proposals? So typically, memory fabric obviously can mean, uh, can mean a different things to different people. And we actually look through all these different variants uh, and uh, these different variants that we played with experimentally. And I think last year I showed some of the data. Like in my team in 2012 and 13, we did a lot of RDMA networking uh, prototyping. And then we were very actively participating in the Gen Z organization. So we went through kind of some of these more modern approaches to how to scale out the memory. And um, Gen Z, for example, um, was um, 
uh, was uh, uh, architecture that really that really um, used a, uh, a protocol to, to, to literally communicate loads and stores for very large memory across, across the fabric, uh, which, which is potentially very, so not the cache lines, but loads and stores. Um, and um, this, for example, is very attractive, but it was really kind of developed in an old fashioned way where spec came first and a lot of people worked on a PDF and implementations followed, uh, or attempts for implementations follow later. RDMA networking um, uh, is, is most, mostly uh, uh, famous through the, you know, through the usage of Mellanox uh, networking, RDMA networking adapters. And, and these approaches actually required a lot of software work that, especially for Gen Z, there was not enough software being developed. So we kind of, uh, the leader of, of, of the group, NVM Systems Architecture Group in my department, oh my God, already. <laughs> but I, I thought it was 90 minutes. No? Okay. <laughs> so, so we kind of looked, uh, looked into normal cache coherence scale out. And this is actually what, uh, what, um, uh, what uh, OmniExtend is. It's really the sort of uh, old fashioned symmetric multi processing um, uh, architecture that. Um, that perhaps, that perhaps has some disadvantages of the SMP systems, like uh, the number of the cache coherence messages that may ensue when you have a large number of nodes, but it has a positive side that it doesn't require rewriting of software. So that was our starting point. Um, I have no idea what this means. So I'm so stupid. Uh, so, so, um, so, what is then the Omni Extend uh, system design? The idea is you have a bunch of uh, bunch of uh, Omni Extend nodes. Um, in in our prototyping architecture so far, we got stuck to RISC five, but it doesn't have to be RISC five. In principle, we can have other protocols. And a bunch of these nodes use uh, use Ethernet physical air to connect to the programmable switch, exactly as shown in this picture. And then. Um, uh, the, the nice thing that kind of happened to us in the last couple of years is this emergence of programmable Ethernet switches. So I'm going to plug in a little bit of, uh, you, you can find all this stuff on the web, but I'll, I'll plug in a little bit. There's a company, Barefoot Networks, that started making specialized Ethernet switches that are P4 programmable. They recently got acquired by Intel. They do have a lot of business. They actually, you know, uh, are, are successful BU now for Intel. And they build these, um, they build these devices that in the first generation support uh, 6,400 gigabits, you know, per, per socket, uh, or 6.4 terabits per second, second bandwidth. Pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, and uh, all, all along by introducing latencies that, and I reported, I think, this in the past, at about like 350 nanosecond uh, clip. Um, what you have, what you have inside of a, inside of a switch, is a programmable pipeline that actually allows you to parse the packets, incoming packets, and make a decision for their processing, switching, logging. Um, quite a lot of flexibility. You can really implement the processor, but you can actually implement a lot of smart handling of the packets, and that's exactly what people do. So people who like a deep inspection love these kinds of devices because they really give them amazing bandwidth and amazing latency for what they want to do. Um, cache coherence, I'm going to assume everybody here is reasonably familiar with. Cache coherence just refers to more than one uh, CPU connected, uh, um, uh, connected in a network sharing the common memory. Um, there is a need for a cache coherence protocol because you have to have cache controllers on each CPU having a meaningful way of knowing which data is potentially being changed before it's being committed. Um, in terms of our um, uh, data plane implementation, what we had to do is kind of, kind of key pieces are demonstrated on this slide here. Uh, we had to come up with a standard on how the tiling messages, which is an existing Berkeley cache coherence protocol, how would they be packed on top of Ethernet layer one frame. So we have worked on this together with uh, uh, Sci-5 starting last year. And this work we actually have pushed now into new interconnect work group inside the Chips Alliance and open all these uh, specifications on the GitHub and open a future work 
uh, on a GitHub as well, both for the tile link based cache coherence protocol, which needs to evolve a little bit towards version two that's going to be good for the enterprise workloads, and then also for the Omni Extend, uh, Omni Extend protocol itself. Um, and and uh, once we define this sort of a packet, each node needs to have a serializer IP that's actually going to take a tile link messages, put them on top of Ethernet L1 frames, and push it out over the QSFP cable. And then now you also need to have an Ethernet switch that's going to understand these packets. So obviously the off-the-shelf Ethernet switch is not going to understand it. But if you have a programmable switch, you can make a P4 code that will understand it. And that's what we have done. And we also, you know, made this work open source and available because obviously we want as many people to actually use this. And, um, and these are some of the, some of the P4 code, code samples for the implementation that are shown, shown here. Uh, and um, this is the uh, picture of the demo. Um, and we have been, it's very heavy. There's quite a lot of hardware. So we try to show it up to a couple of conferences. Uh, sometimes when we have to do all the work by ourselves, we just bring two nodes and we hook them up directly. When we, when we have a help to push up a couple of hundreds of kilos of hardware, then we bring a switch and the power supplies. The interesting things that uh, people m probably will have a lot of questions about, I always do every time I see this chart, what kind of latencies we are getting. Keep in mind, this is an FPGA system running in 50 megahertz. So this is going to significantly improve when we transition from, from rocket cores running on, on FPGA boards at 50 megahertz to something that's a, a gigahertz plus ASIC. Uh, but right now, uh, we, are getting, we are getting about uh, two microsecond um, two microsecond turnaround, turnaround latency when one of the sockets needs to access memories that's located on the another socket. And we think when we go to the high frequency silicon only non FPGA system that we can get into a few hundred nanosecond range. That's, that's how we at least in, interpret this data. And um, a most interesting thing that really got my heart uh, thumping two weeks ago, and I had to put, I put this on a Twitter too out of all the excitement. So, so um, they let me log in um, on uh, Linux running, uh, running on one of the nodes and uh, told me, is Vonimir going, you know, do uh, check uh, CPU info. And these are the FPGA boards. Each one has four rocket cores. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, as, I, as I looked into the CPU info, I was actually able to see eight uh, RISC-5 hearts four on the local board and four that were actually on the other board or the other socket or other board connected to the barefoot network switch. And then for my manager, I, I did this amazing contribution here showing a single liner. Uh, it took me uh, almost two hours to figure it out. <laughs> but, uh, to show it's eight, eight nodes. And I have no idea why is the index showing like one, two, three, four, and then nine, 10, 11, 12. And, I, I, they tried to explain it to me and I, I didn't, didn't understand it. Um, so conclusions. What is this for me? For me, this is a realization of the seven year dream to have an open source cache coherence protocol and interconnect and at an actual low cost. Um, not everything is open source. The serializer that takes styling and actually puts the enormity extent that we have in the current FPG implementation is a closed source IP from Sci-5. But we will work to create sort of a university-based open source version so that other people can, can actually put the similar demos together by themselves. Um, this is uh, almost a true enablement of a heterogeneous compute. I've heard this many times from many people who invested significant amount of money in writing PDFs and, and Word documents. We really went the opposite way. We tried to build something that works. Uh, in principle, this can actually work with other ISAs. Some spec changes may, may be required or additions. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it, it should be possible. It doesn't have to be RISC V only. Uh, and then the backplane is fully open, fully available. We'll, we'll, it's just expensive right now. Uh, so, so if somebody wants to like redo the backplane, it's probably gonna cost uh, a good chunk of money. And uh, what is next? In Chips Alliance, we are now working on, on, the, on the SOC that's basically an ASIC variant of the data that I'm showing here that can run at a much higher frequency. It's a project we are doing with uh, Sci-Fi, another Chips Alliance member. 
And this, uh, this ASIC is going to enable building uh, rudimentary compute and memory boards. And we are going to make those uh, available. And those should be cheaper than our backplane. And we are also working with um, several companies that are adopting OmniExtend interface for their interesting things. So there's a couple of companies that have a unique IP for neural network inference accelerators. Some that have like a, like a, a, a cloud and IO workloads accelerators. And, and they see a kind of a value of being a part of the ecosystem that can all kind of coherently share memory. So that we are working with them, and, and, and uh, I, I expect to see some open source uh, designs driven by Western Digital, largely to kind of provide the reference designs. And I also expect some proprietary, uh, proprietary hardware coming out there that will support, support the same interface. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my last slide. Uh, I have a question about the backplane. Have you considered to use a already existing technologies such as ATCA, micro TCA, or maybe something else, or just implemented your own backplane? Have you considered what other technologies? Uh, for instance, ATCA, telecommunication standard. Rapid IO is protocol. Yeah. Aha, you mean just like a physical layer? Yes, physical layer. No, we, we haven't considered that particular one, but we got happy with, with uh, we got uh, sorry, we got happy with uh, Ethernet because uh, because of the cost. So the cables that you use here and the switch that you have to use here are are reasonable cost for for any industry group and any any reasonably funded academic group. If you look at the cost of cables and a switch, it's ten thousand dollars. It's not. Uh, it's not crazy expensive. Some of the communication stuff goes for much more. So I want to say I think this is awesome. So thanks for sharing. Um, it seems like a, a lot of this scheme is predicated on the Barefoot Networks chip. Yes. Um, if those products do not survive the Intel acquisition, do you have a backup plan? Um, our our original plan when we when we got into P4 was um, Xilinx uh, um, FPGA chips, the, like a four thousand chips dollar chips that have a lot of I/O. So that works as well. It's just not as performance power optimized as Barefoot Networks. I'm I'm fairly familiar with Barefoot Networks and their customers. It would be, I, it's, you know, anything can happen. But I don't, you know, I don't think Intel has any reason not to love love this BU. It's, it seems like a good idea. A lot of customers, a lot of people who want to do the logging on the network, uh, deep packet inspections, security, reliability applications. Uh, there's a lot of applications. So, and the price is price is substantially comparable to the Broadcom uh, normal Ethernet switches. The bigger bigger risk that I have is that another standard emerges, the P5 <laughs> or S4, that maybe some other you know, companies start supporting and, and that that standard somehow, you know, steals away semantics that we need while still supporting these other use cases. <laughs>